You're on. Hello. Hey, Brendan, how are you doing? Pretty good, how are you? I am doing all right. Uh, very excited to, to be doing this with you today. Me too, thanks for setting it up. Absolutely. So um, I guess, should we just do a quick round of little intros here? Sure. Uh, I'm Brendan Ike, CEO and co-founder of Brave. Before that, I did Mozilla and Firefox. Before that, I did JavaScript at Netscape, uh, which I think I've paid my dues for finally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we're both in the dues paying category here. Um, I'm Fatima Catablu. I'm a, uh, an analyst at Forrester Research. Um, and I focus on the consumer data ecosystem. So basically all of those things from database marketing, direct marketing principles, um, privacy and data ethics, um, and really how consumers um, can engage with brands uh, to the extent that they want to, um, to create these, these sort of personalized experiences. Um, and I too uh, am sort of um, uh, kind of doing a bit of penance for uh, my, my days as a database and direct marketer. Um, and I came to this world actually um, because of that, because um, historically when we thought about direct marketing and database marketing, it was, it was catalogs and it was retail. And, and you know, I, I came to Forrester about 10 and a half years ago now and realized, oh, the data is changing. Like we're no longer talking about, you know, I bought a thing from this company and therefore I may be interested in that company. Now we're actually just tracking everybody across mm -hmm. the internet. Um, and so the, the quality and the quantity of the data seemed really different to me. Um, and I thought that marketers really needed to pay more attention to um, data governance and data ethics and, and privacy issues. Yes, all these these risks, um, moral hazards, like the insurance people say, came in. Mm -hmm. I remember the old days, and direct marketing is still going. It's push notifications and spam calls and <laughs> email still. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the but, interesting yeah it changed. The interesting thing is, I think a lot of the peer play brands that are out there who we think of as very digitally native are suddenly in the direct mail business. Um, mm -hmm. Over the holidays, I got a lot of, of postcards and the lookbook kind of direct mail pieces. And I thought, you know, this is a, a really good response to some of the digital moral hazards that you're talking about. You want to get in front of your customers, like this is a really good way to do it. It's, it's like what they call Lindy, something that's been around a long time, is likely to be around forever. So things become immortal, like email, and they change. They don't just freeze. But right. they sometimes have a renaissance. And yeah, I agree. It, get, getting paper in front of people is such a tactile and different experience uh, from flat screens, flat UX. Yeah. That's right. That's absolutely right. Flat design. <laughs> I hate flat design. I'm, I'm ready for some old school you know, puppy design, um, 90s design. <laughs> But yeah, the, the, the surveillance economy uh, kind of crept up on people. And uh, there were some smarties who capitalized on this tremendously, weren't there? Mm -hmm. There sure yeah. were. And I think, you know, we didn't even really start to call it the surveillance economy until, what, four or five years ago? Right. Or, you know, surveillance capitalism, uh, Shoshana's book, right? This is fairly recent. Um, but, you know, ad blockers were coming into Firefox which was the first browser with extensions and now Chrome's extension model one and Adblock plus and no script became super popular early extensions. And that mm -hmm. was 2006, I think. Yeah, I think that was um, to my mind, those were really the, the kind of earliest, um, I don't want to say early adopters, but the people who really understood that their their web experience was being negatively affected. Yes. You know, it was page load times were really slow. It was really crappy pop-up ads and interstitials. And um, and I think a lot of the response that we saw in the ad block days and the ad block plus early days um, was, was that. It was like, mm -hmm. you're, 
you're like really causing an experiential problem here. Um, yes. People would feel it uh, in terms of clutter. I think you had a lot of banner ads still, but you had in-page pop-ups coming in. The window operating system window pop-ups we blocked in Firefox very well, which was one of our you know, key uh, growth uh, features that people liked versus Internet Explorer, which was you know, frozen after the USB Microsoft case and did not block window level pop-ups. But right. yeah, it, uh, t even at that time, I think we were so busy growing Firefox at Mozilla that we didn't think about what was really going on under the hood. There wasn't just the visual problem, which I think you're right, drove adoption of those early extensions. There was a growing um, commerce in, in sort of data or identified users. And in sort of, did we see this user at this site and then at that site? And are they looking for shoes or a car, right? Um, and that started early on, I'm not sure when, um, 2000 maybe, possibly in the 90s. But the, the big uh, ad server uh, originally called Dart that became DoubleClick, uh -huh. Google bought, I think they were, uh, they were about to buy it in 2007, I believe it yep. bought in 2008. And um, that was doing this kind of cookied tracking. And was, I have to give credit, I think it was Steve Jobs, Apple with Safari from 2003 on did do some things for privacy. They did try to block the cookies that are set by the tracking sites, the ones that are embedded or hidden within the page. Like you go to your favorite publisher, you go to the New York Times and you don't expect to have a cookie set by some, you know, appnexus.com or doubleclick.com, but that's, that's buried in there or was at the time. And Apple uh, made Safari block that site with an important loophole that if, if AppNexus could trick you into visiting their site and no one, have you been to AppNexus? I've not. Uh, but if you did, then they could set a first party cookie and that made it okay for them to track you. And they exploited that. They would bounce through their advertising partners. They would bounce you through their website and they would set that first party cookie and then they'd redirect to the ad landing page. And this was if you clicked on an ad. And so they, they hacked around the early Apple third party cookie blocker. Uh, but you know, Things started innovating. Apple did intelligent tracking prevention in 2017. Gray yeah. was out then and we were doing a very aggressive thing. We were just blocking third party cookies, yeah. which was a little breaky at points. So we had to yeah. do machine learning to make it better, just like Apple is doing with ITP. But um, the, the features of the web were not designed with this third party tracking relationship in mind. It was yeah. a, a unintended consequence. <laughs> Those are the best kind. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I've been a, a Brave user since the very early days. Um, and I think, you know, what really attracted me to Brave was the, not just the the tracking, but like, as you guys started to roll out, roll out things like uh, uh, fingerprinting blocking, mm -hmm. um, as you started to make it much more visible, right? Like there's, there's a thing about blocking third-party cookies and blocking cross-site tracking, there's another thing to letting me see that mm -hmm. and understanding what's going on. So I've used all of the tools, right? I'm a privacy analyst. So I've done the ghostery. I've done all, you know, privacy badger. I've disconnect, done, yeah. you know, a bind and disconnect. Exactly. Um, so I think, you know, that's kind of what drew me initially to Brave, but, but I'll back up just to say, so you are, you are, bringing up Dart, which totally cracks me up because I worked for the company that bought DoubleClick initially in 2000, mm. a company called Abacus. Oh, and right. at the time, Abacus mm. was a cooperative of transactional data offline. And the idea was, okay, let's match up this online and offline data mm -hmm. and try to identify, like, if somebody's bought a gag gift, they're never going to buy that gag gift again. Maybe yes. we don't need to serve them that website. And the intention was actually really good. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, the FTC was none too pleased. Right. <laughs> uh, and they said, no, 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 this is not going to happen. You know, fast forward six or seven years and Google buys DoubleClick. Um, and, and, you know, that social norm had, had resolved itself. Uh, we were used to online tracking at that point. It's interesting. We, we got used to it, though. I don't think it was, uh, you call it consent. It was more like um, just sitting in a boiling pot of water that starts off as a warm bath. <laughs> right? The old frog in the, in the, in the yeah. pot. Yeah. 
that that is so I've done a lot of research around creepiness. Um, and you know, it's it's like the Justice Potter thing about obscenity, right? I mm-hmm. I don't know it. You know, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And that's the same thing with creepiness. So I've done a lot of consumer research to try to understand what that means. And over and over, what we hear is it's a feeling of unease that comes from an experience where there is no social norm yet or where it breaks the social norm. So when you go into a store and a salesperson is following you around and harassing you about like (laughs) your shoes you just looked at, like that's creepy because we don't expect people to follow us around a store. Right. Um, On the web, there's no mechanism for stopping that shoe ad that's following you all around. So retargeting at the beginning was really, really creepy. Now, when we ask consumers about it, what they tell us is, oh, it's not that it's creepy, it's just really annoying. It's <laughs> I don't want to see it anymore. I just came back from my holiday and I bought luggage for it and now it's trying to sell me another set of luggage, right? Yeah, yeah. So what are you wasting years. your dollars for? Right. So I think, um, I think, you know, that's sort of what I mean by the, by the social norm thing yes. of cross-site tracking. Um, one of the, and, and again, like I, I know that there are a lot of privacy advocates and activists who would say, no, 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 no. There should be no tracking at all. There should be no behavioral advertising. It should all go away. But the reality is like something like 50%, 48% of consumers really, really like being tracked around the internet and they want those personalized ads. So how do we design a mechanism where the the bar is you don't track people unless you get the signal that they want the personalization and they want to be tracked. That's, that's something we've taken on. Uh, people think we're more on the privacy zealot side, but it's not true. Brave was always conceived with op- optional ads, so there's consent. And the ad decision-making is in your browser where all the data originates anyway. And that uh, ad confirmations happen only through a blind cryptographic protocol where you can't be identified. Now, this, this is, you get a little long-haired at the last phrase I said, but still, <laughs> uh, people can start to understand this over time and buy into it. And the early adopters, the lead users, then convert their friends and family. So we, we agree, certainly advertising is important to the publisher side of the ecosystem, however well-paid or not well-paid they are. I like to remind people the Guardian bought out its ad space and got 30 pence on the pound. So clearly they needed vendors that weren't taking out 70% of yeah. the gross. But uh, we, we, we do the reverse. We take out 30%. And we give the user 70% because we're putting these optional ads in front of the user, not into the page. But we'd like to work with publishers and we want the user to give what they earn back to publishers. So that's the easy way. That's the default in Brave. And, you know, to do this in the browser isn't a tall order. What seems harder is taking the current system, which is very dependent on sort of data breaches, data flowing everywhere, and, and saying, okay, let's start, you know, making promises, pinky promises or trying to do some kind of differential privacy like Google's talking about. And somehow we'll, we'll, we'll make it so that it reform, system reforms itself. And I don't know about you, but I've been waiting for the system to reform itself <laughs> for, forever. <laughs> and I don't yeah, think it will. Yeah, for sure. Listen, will you talk a little bit more about like the, you just used the term data breach mm-hmm. as it relates to data flows. Will you talk a little bit more about that? Because I suspect many people haven't heard that. Yes, and in fact, when I use it, I, we're influenced by Johnny Ryan who worked for us on policy. And uh, we parted as friends because Johnny wanted to go to the next step, which is actually litigating, you know, either big tech or the actual regulatory bodies in Europe, the DPAs, to enforce the general data protection regulation in Europe. And the GDPR says, you know, you have to have consent from the person whose personal data is being taken by a, a data processor or a collector or some kind of entity. They have various jargon for it. What they're really talking about is I, 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 an old model that goes back, I think Johnny told me, even to treaties in the US or to which the US is party. And that's that you can't take data for one purpose and then use it for another, right? This notorious case, Mark Zuckerberg had people give their phone number 
a mobile number, and it was allegedly for anti-fraud. And then suddenly he was raiding their contacts list and using it for other purposes. That's actually against the law in Europe. Now, it may not be that the regulators are enforcing effectively yet, but they have, you know, they find Facebook and Facebook is in trouble in various ways. Google's in trouble. So there is finally, you know, some regulatory action, at least in parts of the world, not just Europe. Uh, but when I say data breach, I kind of use the Johnny Ryan, you know, taking data without consent for a specific purpose. Uh, purpose specificity is in the, in the law. Now you could say a breach could be just like Target has all the credit cards and they get hacked and suddenly your credit cards are on a dark web. I mean, that happened to Target. It happens every few months or years. Okay. Um, but that's a, a, a bigger bang and, and perhaps a less interesting definition of breach. It's, it, you know, security will never be done. Our grandchildren will be doing security. Uh, it will never be fully automated either because it's this adversarial economic game. So you can always run out of money in one area and defend in another and then the adversary goes to where you yep. didn't defend. So uh, it's, invest in security. But uh, the target breach is less what I mean. And it's more of the, the data being taken without consent. And this can play out in, in ugly ways. Like, first of all, just among the advertiser and the vendors that get the ad placed with the publisher in the browser, it's all done in the browser with JavaScript. Uh, you end up with um, <laughs> the intermediaries sort of lying about their, you know, their take rate and they're, they're gouging you on fees and you don't know it. So publishers, this is sort of like the Guardian, some publishers took their vendors that were upstream in the money flow one step called supply side platforms and they routed around them and they realized this, their vendors were lying and taking too much of a fee. So they fired them. Uh, you also get, uh, malware distribution through ad tech, through ad exchanges. This is a big global criminal business. It's ransomware typically. It takes over, mm -hmm. you know, grandma's PC and she wants to get her kids' pictures back, her grandchildren's pictures back. So she reads the laughing skull text and tells her how to buy Bitcoin. It's horrendous. But it's now targeting hospitals, often through other paths than ad uh, malvertising. But it, it comes through ads too. And it's, it's kind of shocking because the ad exchange of which Google runs the biggest is taking a fee on this payload that looks like an ad that really has JavaScript that's malicious and tries to you know, pop your browser by a laundry list of techniques. Um, unpatched security bugs, zero day bugs, uh, old plug-in vulnerabilities, which are fortunately going away. So you know, the, the risk of data breach is, is material in, in even this criminal way, this malvertising ransomware way. And then the flip side, I think the dual of that is real ads going onto fake pages that are scraped from the New York Times or the New Yorker, and they're read by a headless robot, a headless browser running in a cloud. I mean, the, the ad fraud people now use cloud infrastructure. They don't just use machine farms. So they do both because they need to get what look like residential internet protocol addresses. But that's a huge criminal business too. Not sure how big, but our friend Augustin Fu, an adjunct prophet at NYU, says maybe 20% average, but some, you know, some properties like Google and Facebook native search and feed are pretty clean, low fraud, like 1%. Whereas others like the wild west of publisher pages and Android apps are just festooned with fraud. It's just yeah. sometimes almost all there is. And, you know, there's another layer to that data breach thing too, which is, um, you know, many, many layers of downstream exchanges. And so for those who aren't kind of familiar with the, the ad tech labyrinth, you know, if you're bidding, if you're an advertiser and you're bidding on a user and a site and whatever, um, you may not actually have visibility into how many degrees separation between you and that bid and when that ad finally gets shown yeah. and, and where. Um, and so I, I think, you know, a lot of folks, myself included, are saying, look, under GDPR and under CCPA, like we should be considering these, this loss of control over your user's information, right. a data breach. Yes. Um, and, and I think about that from the publisher's perspective, because they thank God, like, publishers are giving away so much valuable information about the first parties that are going to their websites to actually look at their content. Like when you're putting all of your, your page data and content data into these platforms so that you can serve ads, whether they're good or crappy, um, 
you're giving up user data, the advertiser is giving up user data, and all of these intermediaries, because they're data processors, not data controllers, get to fly under, you know, under the radar of regulators and enforcers. So I think there's going to be a real reckoning, especially as we see um, CCPA and CPRA, which are the two California privacy laws, um, yes. be codified um, and, and enforcement really begin against them. And I think this whole, you know, the, the global privacy control that is the, shall we call it the, um, the, the evolution of do not track. Um, you could. You know, I think that's going to make a big difference. There's something, yeah, global privacy control is in Brave and it's turned on by default. You can turn it I off. I know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, it's better. I think people wonder why isn't this going to go the same bad way that do not track went. And I think there are you know, a couple of reasons. One is the actual enforcement, which matters, right? Do not track ended up getting, I think, a submarine <laughs> with, with the government and among uh, standardistas too. That's right. Um, but better luck this time. And I think it's also, uh, you know, technically better defined in a way that you may recall Microsoft in Internet Explorer before Edge turned on do not track. And they said, well, we're doing it for privacy reasons. But at that point, what they really were doing was making it kind of a useless signal for the, 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 the other side of the network, the server side, yeah. because then it wasn't clear that the user had chosen to set it or if Microsoft you know, was just setting it and it degraded the individual consent angle, which, which we talked about. Um, I, I'm sympathetic to publishers, believe me. We, we had to choose a constituency to put in first place to be you know, the one master of, of our house and that's the user because the publishers are beleaguered but they're also not super tech. And they also don't like their audience being stolen and they don't like ad blockers, which we pattern that <laughs> as at first. But you look, I, I've talked to like Jason Kalkanis about Engadget and you know, his experience post you know, weblogs being sold to AOL. And this was the programmatic era where the ads were automated through exchanges. Like you said, there were all this, was all this real time bidding. And what the advertisers ultimately wanted was the audience. So if the audience can be tracked, the advertiser also wants to pay a lower rate for you know, lower CPM, That's lower right. fee. So what would happen is through tracking, the bad sites would take the audience, capture it somehow, trap you there, or maybe somebody impersonating you. And then they would say, hey, we're going to offer you much cheaper ad slots and the advertising dollars would flow there. And so, you know, Jason saw competitors benefiting from this. And then he saw really awful like ripoff sites, just total content farms. Mm -hmm. And uh, this story goes on to this day and it really hurts publishers uh, mm -hmm. beyond the ad fraud problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, one of the things, again, I, I sort of love about Brave is um, you, you have the choice. Like you can say, this is where I want my, my dollars to go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and I think that for me has certainly actually like completely changed my relationship with some publishers. Like I realize that, you know, I'm, I'm going, I might be visiting like a given site 10, 12, 15 times a month, but I'm bouncing out really fast. I didn't have visibility into that before. And I sort of love that I have it now. I think it's really, really cool. Yeah, the whole self, um, the instrument itself, which you know, people who are at athletic benefit from, that, that needed to happen because what you talked about earlier with the invisible trackers, sometimes you like the advertising, the retargeting, maybe it reminds you to buy something you forgot. Often it's nagging you to buy the shoes you just bought, you know, or it's spoiling your kid's birthday surprise yeah. or something. But, but uh, if we could get users to be more uh, interactive where they're willing to and make things more visible. So the simplest thing we did in Brave was on the new window or new tab, we put up some stats about what we blocked for you and how much data that saved or time originally. And that's just huge for people. People have Twitter contests and suddenly the invisible becomes visible and people start mm -hmm. to play the game to win. Or mm -hmm. if you're using the Brave ad system, you can open up the settings and you can open up the ad seven day you know, look back and you can see what ads did I see? What did I like? Did I thumbs, should I thumbs down that ad? And suddenly you're interacting. I mean, to give credit to Facebook, their early ads work did have sort of this open box nature. You could kind of see why they put that ad in your feed and you could say you didn't like it. I haven't used Facebook enough to know if this is still the case, <laughs> but uh, it was less opaque. And, and there's something else coming out of Europe. I think, I forget whether it's in GDPR, the right to explanation 
where you should know why yeah. an ad was placed for you. Yeah. And with, yeah. with deep learning, with nested neural nets, it's almost impossible to explain. But we yeah. use very simple machine learning in the browser if you opt into the system and only if you opt in. And that's like about word clusters and pages you visited and the pages you like the most. And those kind of match locally in the browser against keywords associated with an ad. So then we can say, hey, it was these keywords that, that did it. And that really helps people. So like what percentage of Brave users turn that on and, and go through About, that step? I, I'd say it's been around 18% lately. Uh, we'd like okay. it to be more like 30%. We, we don't force it on because we believe in consent first. And also we think, you know, even if it's perfectly safe machine learning in the browser, there's always some, you know, risk of a bug or some, you know, rare true data breach. So we, we make it optional and we want those users to get the 70% revenue share which they can steer back most easily to their favorite sites and, and YouTube channels and so on. Um, and I think we can drive it up to 30%. I, I, I think you're right. There may be some people who just never like it. We, we had uh, Jan Zhu, our, our CISO, do an early Twitter poll, which is, you know, just anecdata, but it was, it was similar to other results we've seen. Like 20, 24% say, I just want a free ride. I hate ads. I'm not going to pay anything. Mm. You know, let the system burn. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's their right. It's the user's right, but it's not the most constructive in my view. And then about 30 or 35% say, yeah, I, I would try private ads. I would, yeah. I would, you know, do something that is new and, and innovative and protects privacy while helping creators. And others, you know, say, I, I would actually, you know, pay to give back and not, not have ads. And so we're trying all three. And it, it's, it's a little bit uh, challenging finding these segments and what are their true sizes and reaching them with the message. But I think we can get the opt-in up. And I think this will lead into standards. Like Brave is not trying to be the proprietary solution to privacy that takes over the world. We want, and now you're hearing every browser vendor say they want uh, private web standards. Now, mm -hmm. some of them have deep business interests mm -hmm. that militate against this. Others mm -hmm. like Apple have been more private, truly more private, not perfect, but better. And so we're working in the W3C on this now. And it's, it's going to be a, a glorious struggle and multi-year mission. <laughs> it seems to me... I mean, there's so much to unpack there. Um, it seems to me that we sort of have this opportunity right now to get this right before we move into uh, minority report land. Mm -hmm. And and I want to be really clear about, like, I actually think that the if done with user permission, with user control, with good governance, with transparency, all of the things that we're talking about now, um, with an understanding of potential harms, which is like such an important part of this conversation. I don't think Minority Report is like intrinsically a bad thing, not the precog <laughs> stuff, but yeah. the walking down the street and the like seeing the ads, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's not intrinsically bad to be able to say, um, I am willing while I'm in this mall, if we ever go back into <laughs> malls, like right. I'm willing to, to get the offers and the things that I might be interested in. I'm willing for there to be in my vehicle, a reminder that there's a, you know, my favorite coffee places on the way and don't I want to stop. Um, I think those things are actually like tremendous innovations and have tremendous potential but until we sort of figure out the data and privacy and ethics side in this environment, I don't think we stand a chance of getting the other ones right. Well, so I, I agree with you. We need to do a, a better job at figuring it out. There are always things that you only figure out later on, like all those unintended consequences from the 90s. Yeah. I don't want to have to get eye transplants like Tom Cruise. No, no, thank you. No, thank um, you. And we do this thing with Brave Ads where we push the catalog that's the same for every person in a region and update it slowly. And that lets the machine learning pick from the catalog without sending out a, you know, a real-time bid or any kind of identifier on you. So okay. you can imagine that you have a catalog for your locale. And as you're moving around, the browser knows where you are through the gyro compass and the GPS and AGPS radio. Uh, so you end up having this private way of getting offers through Brave. That is a very simple idea. It doesn't, it's not super high tech, except for the, the blind signature cryptography I mentioned, but <laughs> the, the, the idea of set, pushing out the offers to you, uh, people say, oh, aren't they too big? Well, it's not the ads, right? It's just a, a link catalog with some keywords for each link. So it's, it's smaller. It's more like what people already get in their browsers in the way of uh, anti-phishing and anti-malware list. 
things like that. Oh, interesting. I, I wondered about that because um, I think, you know, there's there is a proposal um, that uh, that I think many people will be familiar with. Um, you know, Google is talking about how they want to bring, um, you know, um, the, the identity layer and the ad serving to the edge and, and mm -hmm. in browser and device. And, you know, there's, there's sort of, uh, personally, I think that's the right thing to do. Um, whether, you know, that's going to force more dominance within the Google ad business, whether that's going to require all of that stuff to go through their, their DSP or not, a, a demand side platform or not, that's all TBD. But I think the idea of computing at the edge is really valuable. The opponents say, oh, it's going to make like the device break and it's going to kill battery and it's going to, you know, the <laughs> processing is atrocious. So I was actually curious, like how you guys are doing that. And, and I think that's, you know. We're, we're going to make an alternative proposal or set of proposals because we think while Google's been, you know, waking up to this problem, they're both, you know, conflicted as a business and technology stack, especially when it comes to their publisher customers who really want other script tags, other vendors in the mix, other options than just Google's solution. And they, um, they're also an antitrust court. <laughs> and so it's gonna be hard for them to say, hey, everybody, we're the yeah, Google, right. the best engineers in the world. We've, we've designed the private system. Let's just switch to that. It'll be great. Uh, right. you know, it'll, it'll be fine. Um, and, and you know, it is strictly, what, what I've, we've looked at, they proposed is strictly costlier in network and battery and data plan. And it has a differential privacy, which is a, over time attackable. So we, we believe in stronger cryptographic methods. Uh, and it, it does you know, sort of deal the user out still. It's really about getting other you know, uh, bids in there from advertisers, trying to conserve the Google, as you say, demand side of the story. Uh, as I tweeted, it kind of treats the user as furniture still. Uh, mm. Brave is really committed to putting the user first. And that means that you, you, you know, however good this could be from Google, you, you could add user customization and feedback. I'm sure that that will happen. Um, we want the user to opt in and then we want them to really see uh, that they're not getting their data put in a pot a privacy sandbox that is leaky. And, and so we, we don't even like the sandbox metaphor though. I, I see it all the time from the Googlers. Um, we, we want to do something that takes your devices and your browsers as your first and best line of defense because that's where all your data originates. And one of the things I, I pointed out at Brave that is a bit of a mind bender is Google became super powerful and got itself in antitrust trouble by buying these companies so that it had not only the great search engine it still relies on for a lot of revenue, it had the double click uh, cookies and scripts across the web, it had YouTube, it had Android, um, Play Store. So it, it, it became, and Google Analytics, let's not forget that, Urchin right. was acquired. Um, right. It, all this is tied together if you read your privacy policy. Even Chrome, if you don't opt out and you sign in through a Google account, is, is tracking you for ad reasons. Um, this, uh, this could be done better by doing it in your browser where your data originates. And then it's not just Google. Brave sees all your search engine queries. You could be doing Bing or DuckDuckGo or Google. Those are your queries. The engine is, is a business that deserves to get some margin to operate itself to you know, do a good job being a search engine, that's fine. And you get to choose your search engine generally. But if you think about the browser, it's like the mother of all data feeds. It sees yeah. all your searches, all your e-commerce. It sees Amazon and the, the boutiques and smaller outfits than Amazon. And so why not build a model that's not only user first, but browser first. And that's, that's where I, you know, had so much experience with the browser. And I was sitting at Mozilla all those years watching the Google search deal, which kind of captured, you know, Firefox in many ways. And it was a good deal at first. It was great because, uh, you know, I first made contact. It was with somebody who worked for Sergey, and I soon was talking directly with Sergey Brin. And Google had the best search engine and no browser. And Firefox had the up and coming best browser and no, you know, revenue model or search right. partner. So right. that was a clean deal at first. And it really was great. Those days of 2004 and five, the web 2.0 days, the early, you know, RSS. Uh, it was after yeah. blogs first popped, but before they became, I think, uh, killed. <laughs> Blogs are back in some ways, right? I, I pay they for people totally on are. Substack. I, I, I support some of those Substack writers. Um, so, you know, uh, th there has to be a, a, a client first way in order to defend the user first. Now, this isn't the only way. Like I said, we'll meet in the middle with web standards. But 
I don't think that the dominant player who's in antitrust court should be setting those standards. I think that's too much of a hazard. Yeah, total. So here's the here's the challenge for me is um, I totally agree with you about the browser, and yet we know that more and more people are are not using their browsers on their mm. devices, right? And so then you start to get into this conversation about. Well, if I if I'm not in an ecosystem, so I've got a Samsung phone, but I've got a Mac and I've got, you know, like I'm not in a single um, ecosystem anymore. Like, what is the point where I get to control all of that? And like nobody is solving for that problem right now. No, not the OS, though. Apple has, you know, done some things at the OS layer and including recently. Right. This is going to change the way people do ad advertising and ad tech because they're they're making it so you can't use the ID for advertisers. Right. Um, and cookies have already been you know, siloed among apps in different cookie jars, and then they've done ITP. Um, that's changing the industry. So I, I caught up recently with a, a company in New York that I met five years ago or more. And it, at that point, they were, they were more on very clever creative ad units, but they also had to play in the real-time bid world. But now they're saying, we're cookie-less, we're, tr we're not tracking users. We're just contextual. So I think this, uh, you know, small uh, effect from Brave and, and I would say Safari, which is bigger, and, you know, GDPR, it's the rising tide of, of privacy is continuing to rise as some kind of wave. And it, it's causing everybody to move, even though it isn't, you know, displacing the, the mass market uh, trackability. And that's how these things work. It's always these intransigent minorities and these lead user networks, these innovation yeah. networks, like Eric Von Hippel at the MIT says. Um, and I just hope, like I said, we, we can forge a better uh, set of standards uh, that doesn't get dominated by uh, the monopoly power or, like you said, doesn't leave out known harms or harms that we are finally understanding. Uh, we don't want to just trade, you know, the, meet the new boss same as the old boss, right? Yeah. Um, th but th th you're right. There, there is a, a bigger world than the browser. And so one of the ways we take this on in Brave, and you'll see Augustin Fu, our NYU ad tech, uh, ad fraud specialist, uh, uh, talk about this. He shows screenshots on Twitter where he's got the, the what people think of as apps in Brave as separate home screen icons that he can launch. And they have a little Brave lion badge, but they look like, you know, Facebook or Instagram yeah. or Twitter. And so he's running the mobile websites in Brave. And to the extent that they're actually getting worked on, like Twitter's using the latest um, progressive web app technology, they actually work pretty well. Native apps always tend to be a little better or shinier if you work on them. They also can be full of a bad tracking and ad fraud. And one of the uh, things we also done at Brave is partner with Guardian iOS app. That's their, that's how you find them in the app store, Guardian iOS firewall. It's, it's a VPN, but it's more. It's at the network layer blocking tracking domains. So across all your apps, once you fire it up, it's protecting you. So you, I, I just installed the AAA app and I wasn't sure if it's gonna track me. So I turned on the Guardian firewall and then I installed AAA and then I used it. And then I checked Guardian's version of their shields, which is similar to Spirit to Brave. And I saw, yeah, there's, you know, there's Flurry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> blocked, blocked by Guardian. So there is yeah. a way on mobile, even if you're not using the browser to protect you and we're partnering on that. And that's important. We're also, because our lead users like browsing, we're also seeing them do what Augustine does and run these, big platform apps in the browser. And when you look at apps, right? Steve Jobs said there's an app for that. Well, there is. And I used to have eight home screens full and I got yeah. tired of it. I've cut back. It's really the big platforms that work. Right. So TikTok now, but you know, Instagram, you know, uh, Snapchat, yeah. poor, poor Snapchat. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have any of any of the apps. Um, I, I continue to be an Android girl because um, I, I just want to run everything through VPN for the most part. and. Uh, I, I just like having a little bit more sort of fine grain control. Um, uh, but I, I have very few um, native apps on my phone um, and I run almost everything in the browser in incognito, in mm -hmm. Brave. Mm. Um, and, and like, this is the thing, right? Like part of what really kind of bugs me is that if you know how to do these things, it's actually really easy. Like, 
Every social media app that I, social media website that I go to, I use in an incognito browser, but because I use LastPass as my mm. password manager, <laughs> it's very, very easy yes. to autofill those. Right. And I never have to worry about clearing cookies. I never have to worry about like, cause it's all done. Right. Right. Um, but, but there needs to be, it needs to be easier. Um, yes. It needs to be something that, um, you know, not to be all tropey, but like that my mom feels comfortable doing. Yes, I and agree. And that's what I worry about. And apps always look a little more tempting. They're like this yeah. candy from a stranger that you're just yeah. tempted. It looks so sweet, right? Yeah. I'm going to install that. And, and we, can, we can do more to make that work. And I hope that, you know, the Android and iOS will be friendlier to that. I think it's in Google's interest to keep things webby, right? The web has the open box property. You can index the markup and you can make a great search engine as Google did. So they should want that. Now, 10 years ago when the iPhone was still you know, turning heads and Android was finally getting almost usable, um, people started talking about deep linking and you know, yeah. making apps more open, but it never really happened. Apps are still kind of mysterious and somebody, some security researcher did a takedown of the native code in TikTok and found all sorts of scary stuff there, which you don't want to run. <laughs> believe well, me. and and now you know the the new hotness is Clubhouse, right? Mm -hmm. And what have we seen over the last sort of forty eight hours? We're recording this on February twelfth, uh, and so you know over the last couple of of uh, days, we've seen very strange things happen where you know the the server that was hosting the terms of service and the privacy policy disappeared for a mm. few hours and mm -hmm. you know there's just weird stuff and and now you know there's um i actually did a um i did a ccpa request to clubhouse i don't have clubhouse uh i i don't have the app um but as i understand it it is scraping um contacts lists for all of its <laughs> users to tell them which of their friends is on Clubhouse already. Oh my goodness. So I'm like, well, I would like to know what information you have about me. Like how many times is my phone number shown up within a Clubhouse user's contact list? Oh, I'm interested to hear what they say, what they say in response. Yeah. Well, you know, we'll see what happens. They've, they've, you know, I, obviously I haven't gotten a response yet, but right. I think that that's the kind of thing that, you know, when we're talking about apps and permissions, even with Apple's new privacy labels, which I think are a brilliant idea. Yes. I've been advocating for privacy iconography for years. It's a great idea. Um, it's still self-reported. Yes. So, you know, we don't know. We, you know, the and OS there's no is... way to really get to that. I mean, they have done better over time. Originally, you could just get the contacts without a permission prompt from the user, or it could be bundled when you install it, and people just, you know, they don't even read the install. Of uh, course pr not. It's not prompted. It's not a click through. So they just say, "Yeah, I want to install this," and then they get contracts contacts rated. And I think you know, Facebook did this notoriously. Um, I like Signal, where of course Moxie, you know, is a cypherpunk, so he did this very clever system with others at Signal to avoid seeing your contacts on their yeah. server. And they yeah. just send up an encrypted form that they can match. And they do sort of blind matchmaking between different signal members. And then they, they can even you know, avoid leaks of, of the matches through uh, side channels. It's very yeah. good work. Um, yeah. We need more of that. And then yeah, that's great totally that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the critical principles as we talk about, um, and you know, look, I, I, I the clients that I work with are largely, you know, CMOs and marketing executives. Um, and I'm hearing more and more from them, which is really heartening. I'm hearing more and more about data minimization. I'm yeah. hearing them say, I don't want to be sitting on all of this data because it's really risky. Um, and I, and, and yet they really struggle with the kind of normalization of get all of the data that you can will find a use for it later right which is where we've been for the last 10 years yes so the examples that you're giving like signal and and what brave is doing and things like tunnel bear which has now been acquired but tunnel bear had this it's a vpn service right and they had this phenomenal approach to data minimization which is every time they did an update you would get a little notification our privacy policies change. You go to the privacy policy page and it was rarely we are collecting more information. It was like, no, we're no longer collecting your name. Like we yes. need your name in order to process your credit card 
um, payment, then we're doing away, away with it. We don't keep it because we don't need it. It doesn't help right. us deliver right. the service. Toronto Company, Tumbleberry, I like them. Yeah, I didn't use them, but I read about them. Yeah. And, th- and then they got sold, I guess, but. They did. Um, the service is still great. Okay. Yeah. And, and Guardian is similar in spirit. They, they are uh, cypherpunks who don't want to know. They want to do uh, a very clean model. And it's easy with VPNs, which are still a growing market, still popular, to go wrong. There's just too many ways to tunnel uh, the, through the protocol stack and botch the security or use the same key for all users or all this sort of cloud yeah. mistakes that still happen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk about this for a second because I'm very curious. Um, and this is this is very self-serving too. But like, what do you see as the as the next wave? Like, how do we put people at the center of the internet as opposed to putting technology at the center? Or yeah. should we even be doing that? Well, I think the marketers you mentioned, the CMOs, are you know they're used to the old world where, like you said, everything's collected, and then you can do like regression studies and try to find correlations, which do not prove causation, but maybe you can can try to do better marketing and drive sales. And that that's a, a model that won't go away. I, I think digital marketing needs to, to do certain things well to drive sales. So to be totally honest with you, we're, we're doing these uh, private ads and we're blocking Google Analytics. And so a lot of our ad buyers are still using Google Analytics on their landing pages and they want to go to the one dashboard where they see all their media and see how it's performing. And and Brave would just be one piece of that. We block it, so we look like a total zero there. So we're working on on clean ways to recover that data in the browser by mocking up pieces of Google Analytics so that it it can be signaled server to server anonymously. This is all kind of technical, but it it means we're trying to fit into the existing uh, CMO's needs. And so when I think about what the next thing is, I think you you can't write off advertising. This is where, you know, the neckbeards on Hacker News are like, I hate ads, burn the system down. You know, I just want to block. I don't even need Brave. I'm just going to use uBlock Origin on Chrome. Well, Chrome may be killing uBlock Origin with Manifest V3. We'll find out. Um, So, you know, good luck, neckbeard. Uh, You know, they'll say, I can use my my Pi hole or my Raspberry Pi router. It's like, yeah, but but most people can't. Come on. Um, I think... Getting products to have privacy by default while keeping the, the valuable parts of the commercial system, including the marketing, going is, is, is upon us, right? This is, like you said, they're, they're still sort of living in the old world, but they know what's coming. It's like my friends in New York I caught up with after five years are like, we're cookie-less. We're, we're not even fingerprinting. It's all contextual. And, and so they're probably smart. They're getting ahead. But that is coming in a way that I hope leads to a not only a... a good economics from uh, the advertiser's point of view, from the demand side, but a revival of publishing. I would mm-hmm. like to see publishing do better. And I'm heartened by things like Substack. And of course, Brave is helping people pay their publishers. Um, and, you know, the Washington Post is verified. Yeah. Um, we, we want the New York Times, which, you know, obviously the Post and the Times have a big audience and they can do well with subscribers and even direct sold ads. And the, my friend, uh, Robin Bergeon at the Times is saying, we're, we're going to get rid of third parties, right? It's like- yeah. Uh, that's ambitious because it's you've got a lot of in deep entanglements, but they're doing it. Uh, but smaller publishers definitely don't know what to do or just can't afford it or they, they're bamboozled. So I think we will see a, a better web. And I would love to get back to that sort of web 2.0, 2004, 2005 area where everything's kind of new and fresh and blogs are, are proliferating. And there's a lot of creativity in web developers, among content creators, among, you know, new media, you know, producers. Uh, and I think that's that's possible. Um, people all thought it would be like AR or VR or XR. Yeah. I don't think yeah. so. Um, that's a gamer thing. And it's uh, certainly in, it got industrial uses, but I just don't see it. We're not ready to go into the matrix yet <laughs> that way. Um, people love streaming video, but it's it's still kind of TV, right? Um, and, you know, the, the, the innovation where you might finish the story or do some interactive, you know, multimedia thing, uh, has yet to be done in a convincing way. But I think with the right privacy by default, users will participate. They'll get better economics. They'll be happier. And the marketers should do better. That's why Brave is telling, uh, you know, when we do the direct ad sales, we're saying we have an audience that is off the grid. They've defended themselves diligently. You couldn't see yeah. them on Chrome, but yeah. they are not all averse to ads. So this is a valuable audience. You should want yeah. them to come for them. And that's, that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the things that I've been um, 
uh, kind of playing around with a lot. I'm not a, I'm not a technologist, right? I, I, uh, I sort of pretend to know enough to get in trouble. Um, but one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is that everything is sort of algorithmically driven. And when we think about those algorithms, uh, they are honed to business objectives. And what I really want is an algorithm that's mine. Yes. I want an algorithm that runs on all of my devices on the edge and is, I get to set my objectives. And somewhere in the ether, my algorithm and the New York Times' algorithm and Macy's' algorithm and all of these algorithms sort of make a decision together, that they, that they integrate and they work together. Now, I know that that is a pipe dream at the moment, but it is, to me, it's the only way that we get to put people back at the center of this, of this incredibly important utility that we've yes. got. So, so uh, that's brilliant, first of all, and I agree. And we always wanted this uh, in the web. I think even in Netscape, we talked about you know, having sort of subjectivity. We didn't talk about algorithms then so much as just having the ability to do things from your side that not only express what you like, uh, but also you know, curate and ha have some filtering effect. It could be helping you find friends or like-minded people, it could be keeping out the trolls, which is always mm -hmm. a problem. And having global platforms with algorithms that have to do this is just making endless strife and conflict, right? It's never gonna make anybody happy. Um, so there should be some mediation between your algorithms and your little platoon of your little fleet of devices and browsers and everybody else's. And uh, the more you do to defend yourself and, and try new tech that can create these new mediation protocols, I think the better off you'll be. And that, that, that should also be part of this new wave, this new world I, I hope we get to. Uh, because I think in, if we don't do that, we're just gonna have endless um, strife and people are gonna say, well, you know, I'm quitting Twitter for Parler or whatever. And then Parler gets taken down and Parler wasn't really well done technically. And, and this is not gonna end well for anybody. I think it, it's just one of those systems where you, you have to give um, people home rule, starting yeah. with their own lives. And that was never, um, you know, in the interest of the big superpowers, the tech powers, big tech. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> they're public companies, they have to serve their shareholders. Yeah. yeah, you know, it always cracks me up still to this day. I think the, the last thing I read was like Facebook makes about 20 bucks a user per year. And man, I'll tell you, in the early days, 2007, 2008, when I first got on Facebook, I was like, oh, I would, I would pay a hundred bucks a year for this. Easy, mm. easy, mm -hmm. 120 bucks a year, 10 bucks a month. Sure. Bring it on. Right now you were never going to get 2 billion users or whatever they've got now, right. but um, were there ways for my $120 to subsidize somebody else's who can't afford that Yes, for sure. Yes. And so I think, you know, my hope is that as we look back on this period and as we look to the antitrust enforcement that's happening and the privacy regulation enforcement that's happening over the next few years, that there will be innovations where people say, and we've heard just this week, like Twitter's thinking about a subscription model. Yep. Paying for software is back and it should be because apart from all the things you can do with Brave or similar techniques to armor up on the client side, if you're paying for it and you can quit easily and you don't get stuck or trapped, that also aligns us incentives well and that's valuable. Like, the, like you said, not everyone will do it, but there will be the people who are better off and can afford to and they can help everybody, I think, by paying for the good stuff. And that's yeah. that's always beneficial. The, people say advertising is the primal sin of the web because it conditioned everyone to expect free content. And you know, free content won't go away, but it's a free leg of a freemium model. There's a premium yeah. model too. And we just need less friction. We, you know, I, I love the publishers, but I can't do a thousand subscriptions at a thousand websites pay, overpaying and cross subsidizing content I don't read. I just can't do it. So like Tony Hale at Scroll is trying to do a portable paywall. New York Times spacking it. I, I, we talked to Tony every now and then and we wish them well because maybe we'll meet in the middle, scroll and break, yeah. right? Yep, that's right. That's right. And and the sort of micropayment model, you know, that, that can work. We're, we're helping people do it now and it's real. We have over a million creators now verified who can get paid through the browser with wow. the user in control. So wow. 
lot of YouTubers. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. And the Washington Post and, you know, Quartz and, and uh, Vice and a bunch of others are in there. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for talking with me. Really appreciate it. It was really fun. And, uh, and I hope that uh, next time we can do this in person. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun too, though. I, I don't know if you can bring your cats and I'm a cat person. So <laughs> fair enough. I enjoyed fair seeing enough. them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Brendan. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Thanks. Fatima.